Welcome everyone. Good morning if you're on the West Coast. Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast or the UK further out East. Uh, I'm Marcus Howard and I am joined by some phenomenal guests today for the uh, Inven Global Esports Conference 2022. Uh, thank you to WeMade for sponsoring this and making this all happen. I want to give each of you an opportunity to introduce yourselves for those who are not familiar with you. I'm going to just start with the top left corner and work my way through the whole list and we'll jump right into the questions. Is that all right? Sure. Bradley, if you'll introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Bradley Tusk. I am the co-founder and CEO of Tusk Ventures. We are an early stage venture capital fund that specifically focuses on the nexus of tech and regulation. So I think my interest and expertise here especially is you know, what will government allow and not allow to happen over the coming years. Excellent. Thank you. Daniel, if you, you go next, please. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Daniel Lubinetsky, uh, manager of innovation at the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, so I work with a lot of uh, private companies um, in the innovation space, which is tech, clean tech, life sciences, and definitely uh, esports falls within our tech category. Um, you know, on preparing for an eventual uh, go public transaction, um, you know, it could be really early or it could be right up to it. Uh, really, no no time to start the conversation. No bad time. Thank you, Daniel. Jens, if you'll introduce yourself, please. Yes, sure. So my name is Jens, Jens Lukers. I'm- Jens, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. I'm um, sort of a lifelong um, gamer and entrepreneur in esports. Got started in the late 90s, uh, building my first esports startup, uh, which included like the first league for like professional video gamers called Deutsche Clan League or DECL, which was sort of some of the grassroots competitive gaming stuff in Europe at the time. Um, 2000 laid the ground stones for the basic building blocks for ESL um, as the founding CEO built that company for more than a decade. Um, in 2015, when ESL had its first major M&A transaction, I stepped down from all like board responsibilities and started a, a range of new companies first in esports, which includes uh, an esports team called G2 Esports uh, that some here might have heard about that I'm co-founder and chairman of. I founded a big data company in esports called Base Esports, based here in Berlin as well. Uh, which sort of processes esports data and like provides data services in particular for sports books, uh, betting platforms, and media companies uh, that are interested in like uh, sports data and sports betting, um, in uh, specifically uh, in regards to esports. Uh, and ultimately, I set out to build a venture capital firm, the first dedicated venture capital firm for esports called Bitcraft. That was about 2016 which set out to invest initially in about 19 companies. Uh, the firm grew and is today at a portfolio size of about, I think a bit more than hundred portfolio companies across the globe. It invests in esports, gaming, and interactive media, as we call it, where esports is still playing a part, yet sort of we invest in the like grander scope of gaming, which is a great perspective to have and the great perspective with which to look at esports. Excellent. Thank you for that. And, and thank you, as John was saying earlier, for all your contributions to the space. Uh, last but not least, Jonah, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonah Blake. I'm the co-founder and chief gaming officer of Game Fund Partners. I also manage a uh, M3 gaming research firm called RA3W, uh, if you want to spell that out, Real Third Web. Uh, you know, my background is not as, uh, I would say, illustrious as Jens. Uh, he has a few more years on me. Uh, I started in blockchain in late 2015. I have two blockchain patents, uh, so I guess I'm the Web3 guy in the room. Um, recently, my uh, well, with Game Fund Partners, we're, we're kind of the new kid on the block. We are investing in uh, esports and gaming companies closer to uh, Web3, but I'd say we're not early stage. We're closer to late stage, um, where I've advised as well as consulted many family offices uh, on the matter. Uh, I guess my most recent esports uh, adventure was last year. I testified in front of the state senate of Ohio on esports betting to include that into their sports betting bill. Uh, that bill has since been passed by the governor and the great state of Ohio. Uh, esports has been included in it based on uh, a good portion of my language. 
Uh, so we thought that was a great uh, deal here and um, happy to be here. Awesome. So it sounds like you and, and Bradley may have some conversational opportunities uh, offline after this. And I want to remind everyone, if you're tuning in, that if you go to the uh, Inven Global Esports various social media channels, you can submit questions there. The Inven Global team will then put that in the Q&A channel. If we have time, we certainly want to get those asked. Uh, but let's kick this right off. Uh, first and foremost, to, to kind of follow up on what Yen said about understanding the larger gaming perspective, it's a $180 billion industry uh, so your projections to get to $200 billion at the end of the year. And esports is sitting at roughly, you know, $1.3 billion. Do you all think or what are your opinions about the claim or, or the thought that esports may be in a bubble? And we'll start it with Bradley. We'll just go round yeah. robin. I think, and to me, this is the same question in some ways, whether the answer question was crypto or esports or digital health, which is to me, at least as an investor, if there is a sector that I think has a really, really bright long term future, then I'm not too worried about whether or not there's a bubble. I mean, to, the, the bubble to me just re reflects what valuations are, you know, today versus yesterday versus tomorrow. Um, and so, yeah, look, valuations on everything are coming down considerably. As an investor, I'm, I'm not unhappy uh, to see that at the point of entry. Um, but no, like even if at the moment some companies were overvalued or anything else, th this is an industry that is very much here to stay. And, and I think investing in it's really smart. Excellent. Daniel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what, what uh, Bradley just said. And, you know, a lot of early stage sectors often see this type of trajectory where, you know, there's an initial rush, um, you know, into them, a lot of valuations go up. And then I think there's a bit of a lull and then kind of the, 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 the stronger players eventually emerge. And then they eventually, you know, the, the, their valuations eventually outpace quite far the previous kind of peak. So I think we're kind of going through that cycle right now uh, with, with esports, along with some of those other early stage sectors. Um, so, you know, it comes to be expected with, with any kind of early stage sector. So I think it's a good thing. Excellent. Jens. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a question that I've been hearing a lot more often uh, about three years ago, I'd say 2019, 2018, 2019, where I would say at that point in time, the question was probably asked for the right reason. And quite often it was a very like prominent conversation. Um, I, I thought so when, when the question was asked at a time, and I'm going to talk a bit later about like, how do we like answer that question today? But when it was asked at a time, I felt the discussion was a bit too polarizing in the sense that like, what is a bubble ultimately? Like picture it as like, well, there's a balloon, you like pop a needle into it and like, it goes off and there's nothing in there. Like that's a, like, ultimately like bubblish, right? Like. The, I think the good news at all times during the last like five, maybe up to 10 years is that the esports industry has brought forward its first business models that looked like they can function sustainably and can kind of become mature and interesting businesses. Um, so for that reason, even though three, four years ago, valuations in esports seem to have been getting quite ahead of themselves, in particular in the area of esports teams, in particular in the United States. Um, I would not have called it a bubble at large, but certainly, particularly at that point in time, there was, again, driven in my eyes, in particular by American esports teams, an expectation set about what the growth and growth trajectory of the esports industry, in particular for teams, in particular for new franchise leagues, would look like. And based on these expectations that had been set, had been raised, and I'd say a certain hype around esports in the media, it was those times when like stars like Ninja made it all through the mainstream media yeah um up and down and many more um of his caliber fortunately because that was great right i don't want to miss those moments i want to see that again and i want to see more of that but 
it was it was driving an expectation that was a shorter term like increase in audience and revenue that I personally did not see happening, but investors invested on that premise. The years after have been becoming a bit more difficult for those companies that have raised capital at those partly, I don't want to call it excessive, but certainly ambitious valuations because growth of the esports industry and their business models coming together over that time period just didn't work out as well as expected, which was a wake up call for many of those investors investing at that time. So um, I'd say the last two years, in particular, again, in the esports team segment, it was a bit of a like, let's see how this plays out. Some people actually don't want to play with it anymore because they thought like, well, it's not what I thought it would be based on what I was told and what I believed in at the time. Um, are we today in a bubble? To get back to that question, I find that less accurate than I would say it was three, four years ago. The biggest funding rounds in businesses that one could categorize as esports, and there's another discussion of like, what business should you call esports businesses? Yeah, that can be a very broad definition, can be a fairly narrow definition. But um, if, if I go by my, let's say, fairly narrow definition of like, what's my favorite esports game and what I do believe esports is truly, which for full disclosure is not FIFA, for example, but the, um, um, uh, like if, if you look at that, I'd say most of the big financing rounds still took place in esports teams. Yeah? Um, and I would say, if anything, we have seen fairly like ambitious valuations in some esports teams in the last six to 12 months still. Um, but I don't think they are like as um, ambitious and like over-exaggerated as they might have been three, four years ago, and they're less in, 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 in number as well. So um, is there some teams, some businesses in esports that have raised capital at maybe valuations that somebody would see more excessive or too high? Yeah, probably that directionally because the market at large was hot. Yeah, very hot, like the investment market and the, the sort of was very hot and um, uh, capital was seeking targets at an unprecedented scale. But I don't think it would be comparing to what we saw three, four years ago. I hope okay. that makes some sense. Sorry, that was a long answer, but I, I thought some context would be helpful. No, there was helpful context. Thank you for that. Jono, what do you think about that as well? Uh, is there a bubble or isn't there a bubble? Or does it matter that there's a bubble? I think, well, of course it matters if there is a bubble. Uh, I, it definitely matters. Well, it depends on who it matters to. It doesn't matter to the players or the viewers. It does matter to your pocketbooks. Um, but but players and viewers don't care. Uh, but I think the definition of, of bubble is very broad. A bubble of what? You know, a bubble would assume that when the bubble pops, as Yen said, that means there's no one on Twitch watching, there's no one on YouTube watching, there's no one buying products or buying more secret lab shares. Um, and the reality is that's not true. Um, so I don't think it's fair to call it a bubble. I think it's probably fair to call it frothiness. Um, but I think it's also really unfair to say that esports is like the only thing that's frothy. Most software as a service companies were frothy over the past 10 years. Most tech companies were frothy over the past 10 years. Most gaming companies and game publishers are frothy over the last 10 years. And you'll see a lot of them merging together and making acquisitions and doing deals right now in a down market because I don't think esports is this secular place where only the degenerates uh, have invested here or people who don't know the space. Uh, I think there was a much larger market reaction to uh, just a very long uh, bull cycle in the market. So uh, the short answer is no. The long answer is I think if you can contextualize the bubble as a crisis of identity, then I think yes. Um, an esports team is not an esports team anymore. It's a media production company. It's a TV channel, linear or nonlinear. Uh, it's a data company. It's a, a crypto company. And we'll see those sponsorship, uh, sponsorship values drop here suddenly, which will scare some investors because of uh, our good friend Do Kwan. Um, we all love Do Kwan and, and Luna. Uh, and I'm seeing similar trends uh, that Jens was speaking about three or four years ago in the guild space in Web3. And I know this isn't a Web3 space, but that's a lot of the stuff I specialize in. 
uh, where guilds are having the same profit valuations. And you can go look at the data on how valuable they actually are. You can go look on DAP radar. It's public. If, if you know how to use Etherscan or DAP radar, you understand um, metrics. Um, Decentraland has about 900 daily active users. Sandbox is about 1,800. And most of those guilds that are raising money are front-running assets where there are no users. So, you know, there's a crisis of identity on what esports means between traditional quote unquote web two esports orgs and emerging quote unquote web three esports orgs, which just have a name called guilds. And I think because of this frothy bubble um, reducing valuations, which it's a good time for many investors, not for some of those founders, but that's how the cookie crumbles. I think you're going to see most of those guilds merge with esports orgs um, because it's the natural progression. And 95% of those guilds are going to fall into the abyss of darkness. Um, I hope that answers the question. It does. These are all stellar answers. So thank you all for being candid. Uh, I know we only have another 30 minutes, so I want to jump through these next ones very quickly. But I, I just want to acknowledge the, that Daniel and Jonah and Bradley make great points around, uh, you know, referring, referring back to uh, the Internet, the dot com bubble. We had a bubble, you know, boom and bust, but trillion dollar companies are created out of that. So, yes, there could be a bubble now, but that doesn't mean that esports is going away by any chance but that is just, there's the valuations are frothy. And Jens, you made a, a great point about, especially, particularly here in the West, we have been, we as an ecosystem have been trying to capitalize off of the momentum that's happening in the East, where the viewership and the engagement and ultimately the dollars aren't following, at least not to the degree they are in the East. So it'll be interesting to see how that, that adjustment happens. And consequently, we're starting to see esports organizations and other esports startups and, and businesses try to diversify their revenue streams to create more revenue, more stability, more long-term value. I'm going to go in the reverse order now. Jonah, what do you think about those opportunities? Which of those strategies do you think will work? I'm sorry, can you restate the question? I had slight lag. Can you repeat? Uh, like it's OK. It's OK. Uh, Esports brands are starting to diversify their revenue streams to create some stability and, and additional value. Which of those revenue opportunities do you think will work? Uh, I could give you the VC answer. I can give you the honest answer. Which one do you want? I want the honest answer. Nobody knows. No one knows. Everyone who says they know doesn't know. Uh, Esports orgs are finally finding what their identity is, and uh, it's going to take another five years to know which, which strategy worked. Is it the media company? Possibly. That's what FaZe Clan is sort of depending on. You can see, though, they kind of have quite an issue with COVID going on when it came to virtual production and sending their people home for COVID. I'm sure that was quite an expensive uh, run, even though I do love FaZe Clan. You've got 100 Thieves, who's kind of a mix of that, where now it's clear they want to build a game along with Dr. Disrespect. You have another angle where, where very big content creators like a Moist Critical, who is really a YouTube commentator as much as he is a gamer, throwing moist esports and the entire org is dependent on his viewership. You've got uh, groups in Southeast Asia who see the value of guilds where in the SEA it does make some sense depending on the play to earn model, which most go to zero. I call them play to zero. Um, you know, most of those esports orgs in the SEA believe they're now a guild or they merge with a guild or they hire a guild person. The, the honest truth is we don't know which one's going to work. Um, and if people tell you they do, they don't, they don't, I'm not giving you the, the real answer. Powerful. Thank you. Jens, can you go next, please? Yeah. So I, I think a lot of the um, additional business model iterations that are being tried by esports teams and that we're talking about here um, are mostly like ideas or approaches that have been around or have been seen independently of esports teams, right? Has there be, talk about hardware, has there been hardware companies that did great or not so great gaming gear? Um, and for referrals, yes. Um, is that a business that can work better as part of an esports team because they have like a built-in marketing channel? Maybe. Um, Maybe more likely not, because like I'm still a strong believer in a certain level of focus, and it just feels if you're like a full-time grown at scale hardware company, you're probably a bit better at really doing that at scale. Um, uh, other examples 
um, talent management, right? Like adding like lots of streamers to your roster being like semi talent management. Does that more make more sense as part of what is like at its core an esports team? Yeah, there's additional scale. You might upscale your sponsorship uh, sales, but like, does that ultimately work better in combination? It's it's hard, right? And I think there's many of these approaches also when it relates to coaching and training tools and whatnot. Um, they've all been tried individually. Some of these models came to scale individually. Um, some of them did not come to scale individually. Will they work better as part of an esports team? I'm generally a bit skeptical um, that there's something that will really make a big difference. When it comes to games, which is the latest flavor, yeah, we're building our own game. I believe there's obviously a very large upside opportunity. If you get the game done right, that's what we're investing in day in and day out and like four times a month, probably in average. Um, yet, it's also probably one of the most complex challenges. Developing a game and getting it to success ultimately is a very complex endeavor that needs a lot of experience and a lot of time and a lot of funding. Does that work better if you're an esports organization to build successfully a, a game that potentially has esports characteristics? I'm not so sure. By the outset, one would probably say, hmm, not so much. Yeah. That would be my like gut reaction. Okay. Daniel, what do you think about that? What, are, what do you think are revenue opportunities that, that could work? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, it, it's really all about, you know, for each company, it's, it, it's, it's different in terms of what they can do to just grow revenue, um, you know, in, in kind of a consistent way. Um, at least kind of where I sit within the sector, because I'm not so much of a, you know, industry expert as a, from a content perspective, as I am just seeing companies, you know, once they're a little bit more mature and then looking to do a public listing. Um, and, and then it becomes more about just, you know, how they can fit within that, um, you know, more mature sector where they're be, being able to show kind of um, consistent growth rates. Um, so it, it it depends on each individual company. Um, what we find, I guess, is companies that have diversified into, you know, whether it's owning franchises and then also having a media or advertising or gaming component to it. Um, so I think the, the 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 jury is still out on kind of what is the best model, um, you know, going forward. Yeah, we'll see. I think it's it's still uh, fairly early. I know you know. The industry has existed for decades now, but particularly for these new revenue streams, the, the jury is still out on that, to your point. And Bradley, what do you think on that topic, revenue stream opportunities? Could be said about how teams can monetize it has been said. So let me just take it a, a step further, which is uh, the thing that excites me most about the sector is gambling, right? So I've been involved in the gambling business my entire career, whether it was as a regulator when I was in government or... Uh, lottery deals or casino and everything else. First deal I did out of my first fund was FanDuel. And what I love about the gambling opportunity for esports is it has none of the problems that you see in sports betting right now. So in sports betting, and we did well in FanDuel, we were long gone, so I'm glad that we got to get out before these problems occurred. But it's a very hard business because it's totally commoditized and there's no way to differentiate it, right? So all of the different platforms, I don't know how much you guys follow this part of the world, but the only thing they can really do is give you more financial incentives to use MGM or Caesars or DraftKings or wherever it is than someone else. But they don't really have much else that they can do uh, around that. But, and the reason why is, you know, if you have an NFL game, you want to put a bet down, a lot of stuff has to happen. You need two teams, you need uniforms, you need referees, you need a stadium. There's a lot of friction, right? Now, just imagine instead two dudes are playing Madden and you're betting whether the next play is a run or a pass. And these are just micro bets, prop betting all the way through. It's literally infinite, right? And so the scale of the opportunity is so much greater in esports. The cost of producing the opportunity is so much less, right? Because, you know, in addition to a football game taking a lot of logistics to happen, it's a big expensive proposition, right? A lot has to go into it. So to me, you've got something that can provide far more output and cost far less on the input. 
And I think that's really the opportunity. Um, it came up before that, you know, the Ohio Senate states are starting to look at this. Um, at Maryland, uh, Louisiana, Illinois have all done some stuff on it already. Ohio. Um, and I think that there'll be, you'll see the same iteration that we've seen with every other form of gambling, which is politicians will get nervous because they'll say, oh, this is going to get teenagers gambling. Everyone will talk about age verification and all the other state ways to block VPNs and all the other stuff that we talk about. But then ultimately, they always want the money, right? They always need the revenue, which means it might take a few cycles, but states will legalize esports betting um, simply because if you're a politician, your only goal is to get reelected. And if your choices are the tough budget year, cut spending for popular programs, raise taxes, or allow stuff like esports betting, you're going with esports betting. And so to me, it's just an unbelievable opportunity. We're, in fact, out of our third fund incubating the esports betting uh, platform right now. So we love this idea. It's an interesting point. You have essentially that in order for that opportunity to, to really kind of reach its full value, that you have to scale esports, which coincidentally or maybe con conveniently or inconveniently comes at the expense of the current model of kind of centralizing around specific teams. You're talking about individuals playing versus these teams that have spent hundreds, hey, collected like, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, about this company, Gorilla, which is you know, still very, very early, we don't really worry about teams at all. We worry about tournaments and getting you know esports athletes in there and then creating the opportunity to stake different people who, who you support. Um, that's where the scale is and the scope is, in, in my view. So. Yeah, I mean, there probably are good solutions for esports teams and maybe a way to integrate them doing, but it's definitely not part of our thought process. Can, okay. can I make one quick comment on this since I was the one who Please. wrote the Ohio legislature? <laughs> so uh, the, the one thing is you'd be surprised how many people don't know what esports is. Uh, I will tell you in the language we had to write, we could not write esports. We had to write video game competitions, which there's a big difference if you actually play esports between competitive gaming and esports. I agree with you. There, there's a lot of growth there, um, and I'm spe specifying the U.S. Europe has already <clears> been doing this, and Europe has a different taste. And Jens can comment on that because that's his domain. Um, obviously, the one part is in the U.S. I won't specify Europe. Is player props will do better because most people in the U.S. don't follow teams; they follow players, which is why we have so much churn around players. So I agree with the player prop. The only other issue we have with esports betting is is the data itself. It's not like the NFL or the NBA where there are, are very set rules that everyone understands and they're relatively simple comparatively. You know, the rules for CSGO vary greatly from the rules from Rocket League and, and the what we would call in gaming the RNG is is a lot more sporadic. I think that'll change over time. And again, I'm I'm bullish uh, as the young kids say on esports betting, um, but I think we have we have work to do. Let me just then throw in there, if you think that the Ohio experience was tricky, so I spent the first 15 years of my career working directly in city, state, and federal government, um, you know, wait till you kind of get to places that are even less sophisticated than Ohio, or think about this, the only time in life Mark Zuckerberg ever looks good these days is when he's testifying before Congress, because they look like such idiots in comparison that Zuckerberg sort of seems sympathetic by, you know. Uh, alongside against them. So, yeah, I mean, that's just going to be the norm. Last thing, this is not my show, but I do want to say this because, uh, Bradley, that's why we pick swing states. Uh, and, and I'm not an Ohio shill, but I love, first of all, they treated me like amazing. So they're amazing people. Really had great hospitality, good food. But um, Ohio in particular has such an important significance in the United States um, yeah. that most states, quite frankly, don't want to build things from scratch. They want to build things from other states that have done it well, and they maybe yeah. want to add their own flavor. So that's why we picked, you know, a great state like Ohio. Yeah, if, if you look at, sorry, because we're dominating seven. If, if you look at the history of legalizing different forms of gambling, whether it's sports betting, riverboat casinos, lotteries, whatever it is, usually once about a dozen states do it, that seems to create the comfort level for a lot more to follow on. And there's always going to be a few that, like, a Utah that's never going to do anything, right? So you'll, you'll never get to 50. Um, but yeah, I think once we can get from like Ohio to maybe that's a really good idea with starting the swing states and get to 10, 11, 12, then I think from a political standpoint, it moves pretty fast. Excellent, excellent. We're going to shift gears here. But before we do that, Yenzo, I wanted to follow up on that comment that you made around the difficulty 
to create a game, how many thousands of lines of code that go into making a good game. We see talented teams miss on it regularly, right? What was it? Uh, Cyberpunk 2077 was in development for 10 years and it didn't have a spectacular launch across all platforms. Um, you know, th there's a, a concept called the indie apocalypse where, uh, you know, even though 75% of games are made by independent game developers, you rarely hear of any of them unless they break out. So I'm not saying that, that a team with a large audience like a Hundred Thieves can't do it, but I think they may be underestimating the other pieces outside of that pure promotions that needs to go into a successful game. Yeah, you, you see, I, I believe the greatest chance to ultimately incarnate a new game is probably with a clean slate and clear focus. Well, that's, that's, I'm, I'm not saying you can't do it as part of an esports team. Uh, there's certainly a certain level, uh, there's certainly a high level of experience in like what does make a great game, right? And, and, and like what game is probably missing or where's there a blank spot in, 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 in which genre right now? Um, there's certainly a lot of that expertise. An esports team with good funding might be able to attract good talent as well. But there's, there's a certain benefit of having a clean slate, no dependencies, and just like incarnating a team from scratch with the focus of accomplishing a new game. And here it's tied into an organization with uh, certain um, dependencies, with certain strategies that I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how it necessarily like qualifies to, to do it that much better. Yeah. I, 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 um, and it's, it's a long shot, right? Like for, for um, I mean, I picture if you're an esports team, you're building a game, if that game that you build and pour two, three years into doesn't work, that probably is a bigger problem for the organization at large. Sure, it's, it's a big problem for a startup that does one game and it fails, right? But like, um, I, I think it's probably a bigger problem for something like that failing um, than, I don't know, you tried to produce esports keyboards as part of an esports organization. Yeah, like I, I, I guess the repercussions and the brand impact of a game failing or not being fun ultimately for the brand strike me as being like tougher than in some of the other areas that you could venture into. That's a great point. And, and hopefully we have some teams that are tuned in listening. Again, I'm not against teams creating games. I have personally and, experienced and, and Don't that. get me wrong, right? Like, I mean, what, what I want to make sure is like, I'm, I'm, this is all a game of chances and probabilities. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it can't work. I'm very excited about the level of enthusiasm and, and innovation and like go out and try. And I'm excited about teams trying to play with these different business models. Uh, if, uh, like, like to, to counter that point, like, is it actually necessary that esports teams have to innovate like crazy with all different business models? Like, what happens if they don't and they stick with the core of an esports team business is to begin with? What would actually happen then? Like, I, I guess based on the pre-assumption that esports is going to become a very large part of sports entertainment at large, if that happens, Esports teams ultimately, at some point in time, with their core business, will be billion-dollar businesses. Even with their core business, the question is at what, in what time period, and over what, like time, will you potentially get that the market can facilitate that? I think what we're seeing right now a lot is a race to billion-dollar valuation by like trying a lot of different things to somehow get there faster, and. That again is tied to how do you finance yourself? Well, if you get venture capital financing with an ambitious valuation for your esports team, then you have to show growth. Yeah, because those people that like put that money on your bank account, they expect certain returns over certain time periods. That's how they're set up. And so you have to come up with ways on how to like return that capital for your partners and co-owners. The question is if venture capital in particular is the right form of financing for esports team. The question is, is it necessary that they have to find any avenue to show growth beyond what the core of esports actually represents and something that's like tightly and closer to it? That's, I think that's, that's something that I'm probably more curious to really see. I, I, I think there's a certain beauty 
to just get clear with the fact that growth in esports is not exponential growth. You know, building ESL to a scale and ultimately selling it at a billion US dollars, that took 15, 20 years. In 2005, when this thing was five years old, I thought like, it's gonna be 10,000 people in that stadium and they're all gonna come and watch the stuff that I build, right? I build and they will come. The reality was it was a thousand people. And that was not because the product was crap, like it was a good show, it was a great show and it was great games. The main reason is that the audience was yet too small. Like we have to still understand that we are still growing esports with every generation. That's still a fact, you know, and you can't just accelerate that. It's, it's, it, it doesn't work that way. And so the fundamentals of esports are right and they work in the favor of esports still and undeniably, but the anticipation of how fast and how quickly esports growth is something that's just like, I think wrongly anchored um, oftentimes. And um, if you, if you find if, if you built the wrong model, if you take the wrong form of financing or financing with the wrong pre-assumptions on board, it can, it's going to get you in trouble. All of these great answers. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to focus on this one more question. If we have time, we'll get to the others. And I'm going to preface this question with some context because it's, it's going to be a challenging one for all of us to answer. Uh, I would be remiss if I don't acknowledge the fact that there are no women investors on this panel. Um, and, and I happen to be the only black person on this panel. Uh, the research in organizational growth consistently shows that diverse organizations or organizations with diverse leaders consistently outperform their non-diverse peers. Here in the US, and I can't speak globally, but here in the US, 83% of black teens play video games, which is 15% higher than every other racial group for that age demographic. And the black community in the US is actually the largest consumer of games in the US. However, globally, less than 2% of gaming industry professionals are black. Separately, the Entertainment Software Association's 2021 report showed that 45% of gamers in the US are women. Yet again, we don't have any women investors represented here, and they are rarely represented on the front or the, the back of the camera or the front of the camera or in leadership opportunities in various organizations. What are you all doing within your portfolios or individually to address authentic inclusion? Not because it's the moral thing to do, but because it is just fundamentally good business. Can we start with you, Bradley? Yeah, I mean, you're 100% right because it's, yeah, there is the moral, media, political, you know, goal of not being criticized for not being sufficiently diverse. But beyond that, you know, the market is not made entirely of white men, right? And so my perspective covers one demographic, um, but it's just one, right? And so if, if all I'm talking to are other guys like me, uh, I think we're going to miss quite a bit. So it's, it's a very real concern that we have. Um, we do a few things, and I'm not sure that it's enough, but um, we really, really focus on making sure that we've got uh, people of color working on the investment team. Um, itself, uh, and we'll, you know, I think I might get in trouble with EOC for saying this, but like, we will just screen out Caucasian candidates sometimes because my view is we've got plenty of Caucasians already. Um, number two in our portfolio, same thing, which is uh, there are times where we lean in because the business reaches a demographic that we may not know as well, but we want to learn a lot more about. And on the flip side, we have founders in our portfolio, you know, who are doing drones or construction financing who are black, um, but their business has nothing to do with race one way or the other. Um, but I would say that as we are weighing investments and there's so many factors that go into it and we project something like almost 99 percent of the deals that we see, um, if the founder is a woman or a person of color, uh, I'm much more likely to be yes. Okay. Thank you for your candor. And again, you know, there's no judgment here. I think that everyone wants to understand how they can align their growth with your metrics for success so that everyone wins. So thank you for that. Daniel, can you go next, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, so definitely in the public markets, um, commitments to diversity uh, have, have become, uh, you know, rising to the top of the headlines and are becoming more and more important. Um, you know, for, for the Toronto Stock Exchange, particularly since 2014, um, we've had companies disclose their gender diversity initiatives. 
um, in, share, in shareholder letters and, and other types of disclosure. Um, and, and other types of diversity as well are, are greatly encouraged of our listed companies. Um, and, and we do as much as we can to involve community organizations um, being involved in the capital markets and bringing them closer um, you know, in, in, into the market as well. Um, so, so certainly, um, you know, it's a big commitment and, and I think shareholders, uh, definitely agree. Um, and so in the long run, as you said, you know, the, the, the customer base is very diverse. And so having the, uh, management and the, the shareholder base reflect the customer base in the, in the long run is, is, is better for everybody. Thank you. Again, I believe that there are tons of investors that need to hear that, uh, again, it's it's just good business practice. Uh, Jonah, can you share how you and or your fund are uh, actively working to improve inclusion amongst your portfolio? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. A absolutely. Um, you know, I'll say this. We're new. And quite frankly, the team is still growing. And I hope, uh, my hope, and certainly if, if I have any, anything to say about it, which I definitely do, uh, it will grow to be more diverse because I'll just tell you quite frankly, we could be more diverse. Uh, I'm not, you know, most people not here. I'm just saying generally, general speak. Uh, a lot of uh, white guys say, "Look at how much I'm doing. I'm the best." And it's like a video game player, and they're like, "Here, look at the scoreboard. See, I'm doing so much." I, I and I think that's so disingenuous. Um, and you know, with our portfolio, and we're, you know, we just started making investments. There are several, uh, both uh, two in mind. I'm thinking of that are diverse that I'm very interested in. Uh, one's a woman uh, in the gaming world. Another is an uh, underrepresented founder uh, in the esports world. We haven't done anything yet, but I would love to. You know the you know the way the markets are going now. Um, I'll give you two examples of ways that I wanted what we worked on to be um, give people who are underrepresented opportunity. Um, and quite frankly, as I said, they don't need me. Like when when people are asked the question, uh, "What have you done?" They turn into a game of look at how much I've done and therefore I'm important. And I think that actually makes the situation worse, not better. It's better when you give the founder the money and unless they want your help, just stay out of their damn way. And that includes people uh, of, of all walks of life, uh, not just uh, investing in, in white guys. So when it came to, and I don't think it uh, was enacted, unfortunately, but I really tried. Um, to have this in there, referencing Ohio, and then I'll reference a company I advise. With Ohio, in my initial um, testimony and writing, which you can go look in the recording, uh, my big my big ask was obviously the advantage of taxes coming to the state, right, rather than being offshore. Uh, I had asked that in order to get a license to operate uh, a sports book, both mobile or or, or physical, uh, you would be required to open up uh, high tech computer labs um, in communities that may not have those computer labs um, in the state. Um, so I demanded that you would have to put in one or two, have top of the line gaming equipment, and then of course pay for the software subscription. So people who either wanted to go there and play games could, and of course there was a, you could, you know, people could pay to do that, but you would be required to assist school districts locally that didn't have the proper computer labs um, to pr provide offsite availability to their students or people who just, don't have those opportunities. Um, again, that doesn't make me special, but I, I do believe, and me being 26, a lot of people my age believe this is, um, ethical capitalism can work, it can exist, and I think you can make money doing good things. I don't think money is inherently evil or good. I think it's the people who control the money. Uh, the second, um, I've been advisor to this NFT-based company called Smiles before they were even an LLC. And, and quite frankly, if I'm gonna be honest, they don't need me to succeed. Um, the, the, the core founder, Wahid Ahmad Zai, who's an immigrant from Afghanistan, is probably the most talented artist I've ever met and may ever meet in the next uh, 10, 20 years. I consider him to be the Kanye of his, of his, of his art. Um, he built these amazing 3D characters in Blender, and those characters have gone on to be adorned by the biggest NFL stars, NBA players, um, eSports content creators. You know, we, we've talked to all sorts. Um, and, and largely when I looked at that company, which they want to be primarily a, a major fashion house, we looked at it and said, well, are there places here where gaming made a lot of sense? And so it happens that we did and, and shout out to eFuse. If, if they're listening, they're an amazing company. We did do a deal with eFuse to 
uh, create esports events and tournaments for our community and for uh, live events on Twitch with prize pools. And you know, he is a minority-led founder. This company, you know, was nothing eight months ago, and we've generated well over six million dollars in, in in sales. And that's not raising capital, by the way. Those are just straight up sales. We've traded over 10,000 Ethereum on the OpenSea marketplace. Um, so I'd say we're, we're quite a well-known project. Um, the bottom line is I'm just there to assist, but to think that I'm so important that I'm gonna make a, a dent um, it is ridiculous. My job is just to, to make sure that the right people, especially people of, of diversity and underrepresented um, areas, uh, get the tools they need to build what they want to build. And if they want to call me for help, then then I'll be there. But I'm not here to tell you about how amazing I am and how, look, they joined me at Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Like, it's just embarrassing. So I won't do that. Thank you again for your candor. Uh, Jens, I want to make sure you have a chance to, to answer that. And then we're going to wrap up shortly afterwards because we're running very short on time. Sure. Um, so number one, um, like at all times when I build companies myself, um, in a sense, I'm still building the word Bitcraft, but like I've, I've never really like considered race, nationality, gender in any way. Like for me, the only thing that always matters is like what, where somebody wants to go, where's his passion, where's his like skills and, and his, his ambition. And I, I don't know if that's because I play too many video games and like, I just like, there would be people behind like, uh, chats or or avatars anyway <laughs> anyway at the end but like it, it never really matters for me right and, and for me like what i see I'm, I'm european right german in particular and uh, like a lot of the discussion and it's like i want to say like in the in the strength and force that happens in the u.s sometimes like was just like a, like a bit puzzling for me here from from my vantage point but at the same time though um uh, like, uh, besides of just like building organizations in a diverse way at all times, which I just want to underline, it is just so much better for culture and product at large, if you're able to do that, that you bring together a diverse team. So I just have a true fundamental belief in that. Um, I was able to finance what I believe was the first ever full female founder esports startup called the Story Mob. Uh, three female founders that built the first dedicated PR agency in esports, pretty well known, I believe. Um, that was about 2017. I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, uh, I um, uh, we put together with Bitcraft a diversity initiative in 2020, which uh, is an initiative where we hold ourselves accountable to the Mansfield rule, a rule that like uh, 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 like suggests to consider uh, at least 30% of applicants for any new job that opens up from minority or like underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, and we don't only hold ourselves accountable to that at Bitcraft, but we have actually got the buy-in from more than 90% of our portfolio companies at Bitcraft that all agreed to follow that principle. So we're like challenging ourselves at all times. Like, do we make progress? Like, are we considering this? Is this working fine? So that's one, it's a Bitcraft initiative. And just by numbers, in the last 12 months, we invested in eight companies with Bitcraft. Uh, and I just put a post out today on LinkedIn about that. Um, and that was all diverse founder and leadership teams that we invested in. That, that was eight companies in the last 12 months in gaming and interactive media. So we're, we're quite proud of that. And it's, that's, that's all fantastic teams and, and building fantastic products. Excellent. Again, thank you all for your candor, your honesty. Uh, just anecdotally, you know, I worked on on my book that I just finished up recently. I, I was very intentional about having diverse representation, um, age, race, gender, geography. There are innovators in here from six of the world's seven continents uh, because I couldn't find anyone in Antarctica. But what I recognize is that because I was intentional about the inclusion in the book, I also had representation in my my sales. Right, I've had. Hundreds of copies sold around the world, 17 continents um, in, in six, or sorry, 17 countries in six continents. So I, I encourage you to continue to do that. And if you need any help, I will gladly volunteer my time to help you connect with that talent because I see it all the time. The talent is tremendous. The ideas are amazing. The businesses have tons of upside potential. They just lack the capital to get from here to there. Um, so now that we're, we're at time, if you all just have one closing remark or uh, if you want to shamelessly plug where people can get in contact with you, 
Thank you all for your time. I'm done talking. If you are a early stage uh, esports tech company and you're looking for investors, we would love to see what you have. Uh, you can email me at btusk at tuskholdings.com. Daniel, if you go. Sure. Um, you know, if you're an esports company, uh, maybe a little bit later stage, uh, considering doing a public listing at some point, uh, would love to talk to you. You can reach me at uh, daniel.lubinetsky at tmx.com. Um, cool. Maybe uh, uh, the organizers can share my email address. Uh, feel free to do it. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Jens, if you will. Yeah, sure. Like, we're here at Bitcraft, we're a team of like builders in the esports and gaming space. Uh, we love to work with people that are passionate about gaming and esports. Uh, and if you are so, you want to build something, then like this year is the brand and the website that you can go to accordingly, Bitcraft with a K and not a C. Um, and thank you very much, Marcus, for hosting us here. That was fantastic. Thank you. And last but not least, Jonah. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for hosting this. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to carry me in Valorant, I'm happy to give you my Riot ID uh, or 1v1 me in Rust. If you beat me in Rust, I, I will definitely look at your deck. I can guarantee you that. So you can find me uh, playing a video game, first and foremost. You can also find me on Twitter at Real Jonah Blake uh, because I am a DGen and don't care about LinkedIn so much, if I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, my uh, or our website is gamefundpartners.com, um, and you can reach out to me directly in email. And I apologize for the long email; it was a security thing. It's just what it is. It's jb at gamefundpartnersgroup.com. It's a mouthful, but that's your shot. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us in the audience. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get any questions out of Q and A, but we appreciate your attendance and support. Thank you, Jess, the uh, Inven Global Esports Conference team. Uh, we mix everyone. Thank you all for your support. Uh, feel free to connect with each of these uh, amazing gentlemen on LinkedIn and the various channels that they shared. And we'll see you on the flip side.